stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 24 to 26. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a terrible thing for a person to be condemned and sentenced to prison for a crime that he didn't commit. Even if the victim of a miscarriage of justice is later proved innocent, and released from prison, the injustice can't be completely undone. Even though the state may make some financial amends, nothing can restore the years of freedom that have been lost in prison. It must be difficult for one who has been the victim of such injustice to keep from becoming terribly bitter. In the text for this evening, we see an even greater tragedy This is the condemnation and the sentencing to death, not merely of an innocent man, but of the sinless Son of God. Here was no ordinary case of mistaken justice. In our sense of honesty and fairness, just revolts at this sickening scene that takes place in the Roman Praetorium. But as we look more closely at the people involved in this shameful episode, we know that they don't stand alone. To some degree, all the motives and attitudes that we find at work there are still with us today. Hatred, prejudice, false accusations, envy, dishonesty. These sins bind men of today to those men of 2,000 years ago. These things also raise their ugly heads in our hearts and in our lives. We must constantly battle to keep them under control. Therefore, it's not out of place to ask, were you there when he was condemned? We observe that as Jesus, only a short time before, was condemned by the church, he's now condemned by the state. Pilate, the Roman governor, admitted that it was within his arbitrary power to release or to crucify the innocent Christ. And in spite of his better judgment, he chose to condemn an innocent man in order to save his own position. He was a politician in the bad sense of that term. With a pathetic show of right, he washed his hands before the clamoring mob, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person you see to it. This wasn't the only instance in which Christ and his church have been condemned by the state. Others soon took Pilate's place. For 300 years since the Roman emperors, uh, after Pilate, those Roman emperors condemned Christ and his followers as persons that were dangerous to the state. Christians were hunted down and were put to death. The sands of the Roman arenas ran red with the blood of the martyrs. In our own time, the Islamic State has condemned Christ as dangerous to the people and has rooted out Christians, causing persecution and death to many. Now we rightly abhor all condemnation of Christ by the state. But let us remember that we as Christians in America have a unique responsibility for our government. The relationship of church and state 
should of course be vitally important to all citizens, particularly to Christians. If by indifference to our civic duties and responsibilities, we permit government to fall into the hands of unscrupulous people so that justice, honesty, fairness, and truth are violated, are we not inviting and abetting the condemnation of everything that Christ stands for? Will not the work of the church, the cause of Christ's kingdom, be made more difficult? In many ways, without our thinking, we may become guilty of condemning Christ and His cause, not so much by sins of commission, but by sins of omission. And in the end, is there really ever any difference? The condemnation of our Lord by a representative of the Roman state should remind us that we can't be content scrupulously to avoid condemning Christ. We should the more vigorously preach Him, confess Him in our lives as Christian citizens, and be ready to serve Him in public office if we have the ability or the opportunity. But look again at the biblical scene. We observe furthermore that Christ was condemned not only by an official of the state, but just as much by the people. When Pilate hypocritically washed his hands of Jesus' blood, the people shouted, His blood be on us and on our children. A terrible thing to say. On Palm Sunday, a few days before, some of these people doubtlessly had acclaimed him with hosannas. What made them change? Well, Matthew records the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. In their judgment of Jesus, the people were influenced, prompted, and goaded by others. Their mistake was that they let others do their religious thinking for them. This is a common mistake. Jesus warns against it. Once, when he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He said to them, but who do you say that I am? We must know him for ourselves. But our faith in him, our thinking of him, must be based on God's word and not on man's. Some people are guided in their religious thinking by what prominent people think. If a celebrity expounds on the subject of religion, many people will go along with it because a very important person has said it. Well-meaning Christians sometimes adopt the same attitude. They believe what they do because their parents, their church, or their pastor teach it. Now the teaching may be correct, but the teachers aren't the ground of faith. Our religious thinking must be based solidly on God's Word. To build otherwise is to court disaster. Remember, the people in Pilate's court condemned Jesus because they let others do their religious thinking for them. Furthermore, we see in this crowd another common human failing, or sin. That is the inclination to judge and condemn our neighbor without just cause. How often don't we misjudge a person's remarks or actions and put the worst construction on them? Or how often don't we listen to prejudice reports and then we jump to condemn? Jesus cautions us, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. He knows what it is to be condemned by cold, loveless, misguided judgment. It was also this sin of man that added to his great suffering. Well, can we honestly say that we have never had any part in these sins which were involved in the condemning of our Lord? Surely our hearts tell us that we were there. It's only when we admit that we were there, that it was for our sin that He suffered and died, that we can see Him as our Savior. It's only after we have acknowledged our sin and have repented of our sin that we can say of Him as Paul did, He loved me and gave Himself for me. 
This means that in Him, by His innocent suffering and death, for the sin of all mankind, I too, you too, can find pardon and peace. By His condemnation, He freed us from condemnation. So there is now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How can we explain the magnitude of God's grace in Christ? We, of course, can't. We can only wonder at it. But our wonderment must soon give way to the question, can't I somehow make amends for the sorrow and the pain that sin, my sin, has caused him? And the answer again is no. You never can. He, Christ, has made the atonement for that before God. For this, we are forever indebted to Him. But there are ways in which we can show our grateful love to Him. First, we can watch and pray that we don't in any way condemn Him. We can also be patient and forgiving towards those who criticize and judge us mistakenly and unjustly. General Robert E. Lee was once asked by the president what he thought of another officer named Whiting. Whiting? Why, a very fine officer, Mr. President. One of the ablest men in the army, we replied. The president looked surprised. But don't you know, he continued, that General Whiting has been saying some very unkind things about you? Oh, yes, he replied. I knew that. But Mr. President, you've asked me what I think of General Whiting, not what General Whiting thinks of me. The Christian, like his Lord, when he is reviled, will revile not again. We can show our love to our Lord by defending those who are unjustly condemned and by speaking the truth one with another. This is the acid test of our love for Christ, namely our Christian concern for others. No amount of tears over our sin and our suffering that it has caused the, Christ the Redeemer will mean anything if our love doesn't go out to those whom He redeemed and who are precious in His sight. What us this evening as we see again the tragic spectacle of the innocent Christ condemned to death for our sins. Ask His help to be more loyal to Him and to His church, to speak more boldly and positively in His behalf, and to defend our neighbor when he is unjustly condemned. For in this too, His blessed word applies. As you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.